In this episode, we have a special guest. His name is Graham Garrison from ETAC, and Graham lays out for us some of the uh, um, internal details behind some of the new hardware that was released with PanOS 9.0. Graham is one of the leads in the engineering tech organization, and as such, he has access to some really amazing insights and information, and he's gonna talk to us today about the architecture of the firewalls and PanOS and, and how data and packets stitch through the various components. It's actually pretty amazing to think about how much thought and design went into the architecture, which I think you guys will really find illuminating. Yeah, so if you've ever wondered exactly how kind of a packet flows through the firewall and, you know, the 7000 series is a little bit different than our others, well, this is a really good episode for that. The other thing that um, was fun is that uh, we had Graham Garrison in the room and um, Graham has all of these insights and tips and tricks when it comes to troubleshooting. So Mitch and I took advantage of that and we asked him a few questions around that as well. Hope you enjoy it. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, I'm double fisting it. Ah! I'm with Graham Garrison. He is an ETAC engineer, and he's here to tell us a little bit more about 9.0 and the new hardware that was released, and anything else we can talk about that you're interested in. You might be interested in why I'm wearing a Hawaiian shirt, for instance. Yeah, why are you wearing a shirt? Well, we get together every year as a team, and so we have team photos, and they make us wear Hawaiian shirts. But I actually love this shirt, so I think uh, I might have to wear this um, <laughs> for every interview going now right. going forward. <laughs> anyway. So, um, Graham, tell us a little bit about what your role is for ETAC. Okay. So I've been with the ETAC team for the past six years now, I've been doing it for a while, and our main job is to enable our support engineers to succeed. Uh, so most visibly, that's working with them directly on customer issues, but we really work across the entire development cycle. Uh, so anytime we come up with a new product or a new idea, we work with the engineering team, with the product management team, uh, to make sure that it's supportable, uh, and something that our customers can work with. Uh, we also become subject matter experts on the features, develop that knowledge, and then share it with TAC. So it's, it's a cycle. Great, so what is your favorite thing about being an ETAC engineer? Uh, it's, we get to wear so many different hats. You know, we're not boxed into one corner. Uh, we can work the customer issues, which span the entire product line. We also get to do some internal testing, try to break things. Uh, we get to work on the new products, uh, and I, what I find most rewarding is uh, I'm in charge of training and education uh, internally, and sharing that knowledge and watching people figure things out and solve problems is pretty cool. So Graham is famous internally because he does all these transfers of information, and he does these videos for, for, for everybody. So when there's an ever new product that gets released, a lot of folks come and watch your videos and do that internal training about how to support the product and what the feature is about. So yeah. um, that's how I first met Graham. Graham didn't know I met him, but uh, <laughs> that's how I first met Graham, yeah. was through those videos. So those, yeah, that's fantastic. And I love the fact that you're able to see what's going on behind the scenes and in front of the scenes and all of that. and then. Um, your connection with engineering. So, yeah. um, so great, great insight. So speaking of uh, new releases, we just released PanOS 9.0. What uh, it's been? What a month now? Or yeah, about, about about. And with that, there's some new hardware. So you can you explain a little bit uh, what the new hardware is and um, what problems that hardware is intended to solve. Definitely. So with 9.0, we really just focused at the top end of the spectrum. Uh, the new hardware was just line cards for our PA7000 series chassis, and uh, the focus was on uh, volume, in a word, and also cost uh, for throughput. So uh, connectivity, 40 and 100 gig interfaces, so we can tie into these big data centers, uh, larger route and MAC table capacities, so we can address the needs of our larger service provider organizations. Um, that's really what we were focused on, uh, high speed, uh, connectivity and throughput, 100 gigabits per second per line card. Uh, it's pretty impressive. So these are the super planes yeah. of our fleet. It's the big right? guns. Yeah, 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 fantastic. So 
So explain a little bit for folks who don't know what a line card is. So we have a chassis model, the 7000 series, and that 7000 series, we've got two variations of it, right, that mm -hmm. have different line cards. So if somebody who isn't familiar with that at all, um, uh, how, how would you describe that to, to folks? Sure. So uh, the cards are what make the chassis work. So depending you, on what you're looking for, you can mix and match. Uh, we've got, you have to have a management card, and you have to have a log card, and that fits into either a 7050 chassis uh, or a 7080 chassis, which is a big one. Uh, so you can have up to six network line cards on the 7050 and up to 10 on the 7080 when okay. it's fully loaded. So that's six line cards and up to 10 on the uh, 7080? Yes. Okay, so take each line card here. Um, how many processors are on a single line card? So with the new 100G uh, NPC or line card, uh, it has three 48 core Octeon processors. Latest generation, really fast. Three 48 core yes. line processors. That is a lot of compute yes. on a single line card. Yeah. And then you get 10 of those. Yeah. Yeah, so that's fantastic. Pretty pretty staggering. A lot of traffic you can push through those things. <laughs> wow, and so I and imagine there's going to be a lot of customers who are enterprise scale customers, maybe um, um, internet providers mm -hmm. and other types of uh, that kind of scale who are looking for um, that level of inspection. I imagine there are other uh, ben benefits, I was going to say consequences, but positive consequences with that kind of throughput. So what kind of use cases is that, that is the new line cards addressing? What kind of customers and use cases? Uh, as you mentioned, the enterprise scale uh, networks, service providers, uh, really tying into the backbone, um, covering huge amounts of traffic, huge amounts of users, cellular, uh, so with the push to 5G, uh, that's definitely one of our focuses is supporting just this massive scale of traffic and being able to secure that uh, and, and our customers. And uh, another feature as well as I'm curious about is, is decryption. So what is the relationship between, with all that horsepower, how does that help in terms of decryption? So you can decrypt millions of sessions uh, with these new line cards. Uh, so it, it's, it's pretty impressive. Uh, but as you know, the move to encrypt everything everywhere, decryption is becoming more and more important. Uh, so you want that visibility into that traffic so you can see and detect those threats uh, and what your users are doing and apply policies to control it. So is decryption and throughput the only benefit that customers will see or are there some additional benefits as well? Uh, certainly, so capacity, uh, just large amounts of traffic. So uh, session setup rates, concurrent sessions, uh, route and MAC tables for uh, people integrating into networks, uh, and also connectivity. Uh, so we can tie into 40 gig and 100 gig interfaces, uh, so we can actually integrate seamlessly in these larger networks. So I'm a customer, and I'm looking at the, the firewalls, and I'm doing the compare chart and that kind of thing. And I know that um, our 5200 series has been a really popular series with the pizza box kind yes. of approach, right? Yeah. So um, what are some of the key factors that might turn me uh, toward the 7000 chassis series versus the, you know, just going with a couple of 5200 series? Uh, it's, it's flexibility uh, and scalability. So say, like any network, you expect the traffic to grow over time, uh, it's seemingly without bound. Uh, if you buy a 5200, then you can add more, you might have to segregate your network with the 7000, you can add cards as your needs increase. So it really gives you flexibility to deploy once and then support that for a longer period of time uh, with less administrative overhead uh, to upgrade the device. Uh, and you can do it pretty, pretty easily while it's in production. So flexibility, also you can mix and match line cards. So uh, if you need more interfaces, one gig interfaces, we've got cards for that. If you need 100 gig connectivity, we've got a card for that too. Uh, so it, it, it can really be tailored to suit the needs of, of the customer. So let's ask, let's get a little technical here for a moment. How does the firewall manage all of those sessions? And if I've got more than one line card, how does it know if, a, if I got traffic coming in, um, is, is it one of those situations where I have to dedicate traffic to you know, certain networks to a certain line card, or is there uh, additional flexibility in how I, how I might configure that? Definitely, so you can pin traffic to a specific line card, but there's a lot of logic in the SMC or the switch management card uh, that's in the 7000 series. And the secret sauce is the first packet processor, and that's really the brain behind uh, the device. It knows where to, uh, as new sessions come in, it can, based on the session distribution algorithm on the box, distribute those round robin based on load, 
uh, it's, it's really flexible, and that's where the intelligence lies. And then the horsepower is in all of the, the line cards for, on the network side. So is it possible for me to have a single line card that has uh, connections to it, and then I could have another line card that maybe I'm not using for ingress or egress, but I just want to take advantage of the data planes that are on that? Can I use the data planes and the processors on the second line card for processing traffic that's coming in? Absolutely. That is fantastic. And that's, that's actually, you know, it's kind of a funny use case. You have this big chassis, and it's fully loaded with cards, and some of our customers just have a couple of interfaces connected. And that's, that's, that's how they use it. It depends, you know, you don't have to plug everything in. Uh, you can add more uh, power to the device. You don't have to necessarily plug into it to leverage that. So the first pack of processor, that's the magic, right? Yeah. So let's, let's go back and think about this. Not everybody understands what a session is or how it actually gets built. And, um, and, and even the logic. So I, it, it, does the 7000 series, say, have a different way it processes traffic than the 5200 or the PA220, um, so to speak? When traffic comes into a PA7000, uh, that line card, there's a network processor on it. It maintains state, and it's going to look up to see whether or not it's seen it before. If it hasn't, then it's going to send it to the first packet processor. Now, that could already be traffic for an active session on a different line card. It's not automatically new. So the FPP is going to look at its global table to see if there is already a session. Uh, if it is, then it just forwards that traffic to the card. It'll send another message back to the one that received it so that in the future, if it gets more, it'll know about it. Uh, and then it's just handled. In the case of a new session, it'll go through that session setup process and then based on your session distribution algorithm, it will decide where that particular session uh, will be owned. <laughs> that sounds very complex. How do you troubleshoot that? All right, I always go for global counters. That is my go-to when troubleshooting our firewalls, whether it's on a 7000 or a 220, that'll always tell you what the firewall is doing and why and how much. Okay, so global counters are awesome. And um, I share your enthusiasm about them, and, and and hearing you enthusiastic about it makes me enthusiastic about yeah. it because the 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 challenge of global counters is like what <laughs> <laughs> like there's it, it's really cryptic yeah. for so somebody who's first looking at those global counters that's a lot to decipher. So, so do you have any guidance around? Um, where to get information about the global counters or how to read the global counters? Well, okay, so I should probably mention really the easiest low-hanging fruit to check is the logs. So you can look at logs. Um, if there's not a clear explanation there and you're still scratching your head, that's when you can drop the command line and you can check the global counters. Now, you want to filter that down as much as possible. So if there's a specific host that's having a problem where you can reproduce an issue, uh, so you're not just doing it across the entire device, which could be tens of millions of sessions, Setting a packet filter and looking at filtered global counters is, is how I always try to approach it. Okay, so that's huge right there. Yeah. So you can set packet filters against your global counters. Yes. So you're only seeing counters that are incrementing that are tied to traffic in that, that match that filter. Is exactly. That right? Am I saying that yeah. right? So if you know the IP address of the system where the problem is, you know the port that it's using, uh, you can filter for that and eliminate all that other noise. So. When you look at global counters, you're, you, you know, you see a long list of those. Even if you filter it on the IP address, you're going to see those numbers there. Um, how do you know which ones are actually active and which ones are, you know, like a week old uh, or 10 days old? Okay. So what I always do, and when I mention global counters, it's really filtered global counter delta. If you're just looking at raw global counters, that's, that's going to give you a lot of information. It's what do you do with it? Right, so, right. But if you can filter for a specific thing and then just look at the delta, so say you run the command to look at the delta, you reproduce the issue, you run it again, just for that one interval of time, we will have counters. So that's, that's really narrowing the scope down to just that specific type of traffic in that specific instance that you want to look at. And even if it's a number of hosts, you know, it's not just a specific system, you can filter for, uh, say, a destination port, type of traffic, that, that type of thing and looking at a, a delta interval, that gives you a snapshot of a period of, in time that it's, it's a lot easier to consume and understand. That's good. So once a customer actually views the counters and they're looking in the context that you just described, filtered and with the difference or the delta, 
Um, what do they do with that information from there? I mean, so if if a customer is looking at the counters, and uh, you know, sometimes that'll help them figure out exactly what's going on. If if they can't and they need to engage support for assistance with that, providing that data when you open the case can really lead to a faster response and resolution. Sometimes even right away. So that's that type of data. If you've done that legwork, uh, so you don't have to do it over again, provide that uh, when you're opening the case and the description, you've got these counters filtered for this specific thing, that tells us what's going on. That and gives us a good starting point. And it's really easy to do, right? Yeah. Because you, you just put a packet filter in there and then it's one command, right? Yeah. And you just include the delta in there and so that's be pretty easy to figure that out yeah. and share that information w with you guys. Yes. Yeah, so the more information that a customer is able to give you, the better? To a point. To the point. To a point, yeah. There That's is such a thing as too much info. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There is TMI yeah. in the support world. Yes. Okay. And I, I would imagine that a good starting place, of course, and, and this is one of the things that uh, Mitch and I talk about to all of the customers when we teach troubleshooting is that, you know, that tech support file Absolutely. Is, is where you want to start with that. Definitely. But then the follow-up might be packet captures and also global counter yeah. results. Anytime you've got a filtered, you've got filtered counters or a filtered packet capture, that's really useful. If you've got, hey, this problem occurred during this day, here's 50 million traffic logs. Yeah, That, that might right. be a little less useful, it depends. <laughs> right, exactly. That makes sense, Yeah, that makes sense. Good, so um, the more the customer can help you, the faster the resolution. Yeah. So those are a couple, that, that's, those are useful kind of tips. You know, and I, I touched on something important there is the time that the problem happened. If you can nail that down, that goes a long way to identifying and fixing the problem. Okay, that's good. Um, so the, the 7000 series and the new line cards are not the only new hardware that we release with 9.0. What's, what's the story behind the K2 series? I mean, that's, kind of, that's the coolest name. K2 sounds like some amazing mountain or some yeah, sort of thing. Yeah. So it's a special offering that is just for our service providers. So not all our customers uh, can get these K2 devices, but for really large scale environments, uh, it's a good way to integrate Palo Alto Networks devices at an even more competitive price point. So, and it also gives you the flexibility in the future if you want to leverage the entire security stack uh, to do so. So K2 is just going to be port-based firewalling. So kind of a legacy type firewall approach, but you can get really high throughput and really uh, large scale uh, amounts of traffic with the new uh, line cards with the 7000 series and also uh, you can buy K2 5200 series devices as well. Oh, okay. So K2 actually fits in with the existing SKUs, right? They, but it's a designation, really. It's a K2 5200 yes. series. Yes. Okay. And so it comes in express mode, is what we call it. That's just doing that port-based firewalling. It's not doing app ID. It's not doing threat detection. It's not doing any of the other uh, stuff that we do. So just to clarify, when you say it's not doing app ID, you're talking about it's not doing application enforcement but is it doing visibility? Uh, is it detecting the applications? So all of your applications will show up as express mode. Think of it as a global app override. But again, if, if you just need port and IP and protocol type firewalling, then we have a solution for that. And again, it gives you the flexibility. In the future, you may need uh, those additional capabilities. Um, so maybe you have an existing contract with another vendor, you want to move to Palo Alto Networks. There's a few different ways that that you can leverage these devices. So there's a there's a transition that can take place. You can you can invest in the K2 because you have a important protocol reason for it, right? But then in the future, if you want to adopt app ID enforcement, there, you can turn the switch on and uh, you know license the box yeah. in a different way. Is that how that works? Exactly. So you can, uh, when you need it, you can purchase a new license, change the mode, and get all of our capabilities, all of our next gen capabilities: app ID, uh, content ID, threat detection. You can use the new DNS security service, everything. Okay, well, that helps. Yeah. So, so the K2 is kind of a specialized, almost in the margins kind of use case. Yes. But there's need there, right? We have customers who have need there, so yes. w that's why we uh, extended the margins, if you will, include the K2 series. Yes. Okay, that's fantastic. So um, what are you curious about right now? One, one of the things Mitch and I like to often do at the end of our show is talk about what we've been learning, and, and it doesn't have to be anything related to cybersecurity at all. Okay. So we have some interesting conversations in the past with folks talking about even their hobbies or um, okay. books they're learning. So what are you curious about right now? Uh, so what I'm curious about, 
um, in the security space would be the convergence of all of these different platforms from your firewalls, your endpoint, your cloud. It's just moving to being a single product, a single pane of glass where you can do configuration and enforcement um, in one spot instead of everywhere. Yeah. And seeing that model change has been pretty interesting and uh, I'm, I'm curious about where we'll, we'll end up and, and what innovations that we're going to have, how we're going to disrupt that. I feel the same way. Yeah. I really think that the whole platform, not in a, a, as a paradigm, but actually as integrated software where these components are talking to yes. each other is going to be really interesting. And I think the cloud changes everything. In that totally, regard. and we're starting to see that with the Cortex data lake. So we can feed everything into a single point and then do intelligence at just a massive scale in the cloud. And then all of our different products and our platform can benefit from that. And so, does ETAC support the Cortex products as well? Yes, we do. Oh, we support okay. everything. Well, fantastic. Yeah. So you support the endpoint services that we offer, you support Cortex and the cloud. Yes. Um, and all the different uh, models of firewall from the VM series to the 7000 series. Yeah. Wow, that's a, that's a big table. It is, it is. Yeah, it's, that's and a lot to take in. We used to, it used to be everyone in ETAC had to do everything and it's just grown and grown and grown that now we've started to do some, some specialization and we have uh, subject matter experts that, that are good in particular core technologies and products. All right, anything else? Uh -huh. What about a final tip or piece of advice that you maybe give customers, partners, or? Well, wait a second, I thought this was a happy hour thing. Wasn't I supposed to get a beer? Yeah, you're All supposed right. to get a yeah. beer. <laughs> we'll have to go for six. Okay. <laughs> you deserve a beer. All right, but... yeah. Thank you so All much. All right, Greg. absolutely. It was, was fun. Yeah. <laughs>Thank you for watching this episode of Learning Happy Hour. At Palo Alto Networks, we are strong advocates of continuous learning, and we hope you are too. To continue learning about our fantastic products and services, you can attend a class with one of our authorized training centers, or you can self-study about these products and services through our digital e-learning courses. And if you like this episode of Learning Happy Hour, consider watching this one or this one, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and share with your friends. And thanks again for watching.